Hey, Bob Cooney here with another edition of the Being Virtual Show. And this is going to be a good one because we're going to talk about sex and VR and the metaverse. And we're going to do it, not just me, because that would be terrible, but we're going to do it with Kathleen Smooth. And Kathleen is a, she's, she's amazing. She's a sexologist and psychologist who's been working in cyberspace and virtual reality now for years. And we're going to talk to her about that intersection and how it helps people and how it might manifest in the future. And so without further ado, here's Kathleen. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you <laughs> again. Uh, again. Yeah. It's so good. Thanks for joining and agreeing to do this. I'm so fascinated by the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Like, I'm actually very happy to see you on the show right now after yeah. this long time. Yeah, it's been a while. So we met at VR Days, no, VR Days. Laval, or maybe Laval, I don't remember. Actually, Laval first, probably then VR Days, then probably everywhere in Europe then. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, um, and I was fascinated, you did a demo when we first met um, where I put on a, a headset and it was a scene on a rooftop and there was like a woman and a glass of wine and and you were doing what i would consider manual haptic feedback exactly <laughs> to, Which is to, exactly to mimic the video of what was happening and 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 um yeah and it got i was like and it was really powerful and, oh that's right and we did we did a panel conversation exactly together Stereopsia. Oh and yeah, we, it was stereo sex, exactly. <laughs> and we talked about avatars and VR chat and people having sex as avatars in VR chat. And so, and it's but it's been a few years. The pandemic has come and gone. Um, and so, tell me a little bit. Let's let's start at the beginning. Like, so, how did you get started as a as a as a therapist and sexologist? And talk a little bit about your journey. Okay, so first I want to apologize for my English that I will make some mistakes because I'm French. So, yeah, it's happened. So basically, my journey started with psychology, but I was always very interested into sexology. I watched lots of like conferences of sexologists that I found amazingly funny, to be totally honest. And that's why I wanted to become a, psych a sexologist mostly. Uh, I did my studies, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so, then and uh, for people for people who don't know what is a sexologist so a sexologist related to psychology i would say would be a person that help you to have a better sex life basically uh, we treat like uh, people who have like erection disorder uh, premature ejaculation lack of uh, fantasies orgasm disorder and other stuff fetishes and very different field but basically it's everything related to sexuality and psychology that are not medical related even though we have some knowledge in this uh, specific topic too so we can just send them to some doctors that will be better than us in this specific field gotcha so I started like this and uh, slowly went to technology and my journey was a bit strange because I was raised without technology as a kid uh, i was living in other country my parents were not really into technology no tv no things no screens things like that and i actually as an adult i so i read i wrote a book called uh, i think it was like the rob does the robot make love or something like this from a person uh, in france that i really hate <laughs> to be totally honest, that I really, really um, have uh, no consideration for this person after a while. And I saw he was lying in this book. So I was really shocked. And I thought, I don't want the future that is it, that he is describing. I don't want this. And I want to know if it's, if I'm just afraid or if it's really something that can happen, you know, the dystopian mm. part of sexuality. So I dig a little bit in, uh, into it a bit more. And I went to conferences. I went to meet some people in the field. And I discovered something totally different than what I saw. Uh, some amazing people that were creative, that were um, very like in smart, very uh, sincerely searching for something new in this industry and proposing a new solution for pay for people. So uh, I got associated with one first person, and I started to make. Uh, 
funny project around sexuality, which was basically, I will say it like this, but would be hiking sex toys to make your routine better. And it was really funny project. I was not earning money from it. It was just to have fun. Like I can give you some example. Like I connected my dildo to music festival. And then I was checking who is the best orgasmic DJ of this like festival. Stuff like this, you know, like, so it was funny. I would like uh, receive my message, text or message uh, from my phone into vibration, like Morse code into my genitals with the sex toys. It was only things like this just to say like, hey, let's have a little bit of fun with sexuality and sex toys. And slowly by doing this, uh, I because there's not a lot of experts in sexuality and in this field, just to say. So slowly I became like a reference in France in this specific topic with some other people. And and then I started to build more and more in, into this world. And and then I met my work partner that is actually Daniel Gonzalez Franco that I work with. And we started to build a company called Imbu VR, where we um, help the, the couples to get better sexual imagination and to break the routine in order to help them cops with like different issue, but also to, to be honest, to just have fun and relax without the side that is more pornographic, but more with the side that is funny, erotic, and doesn't create, you know, this mixed feeling of jealousy, I would say, in another side and also embarrassment because it's maybe too much. So we help them to go through stories and narratives together and then explore their own sexuality. So that, that's why uh, I'm here now. Yeah. So I'm going to put, I'm just going to put the banner for your website up um, yeah. so people can check it out. And, and so talk a little bit about Imbu VR. What is it, what's its mission and, and what's the practice? So, so I'm going to be on it because there's different things in Imbu VR. So at first, our mission was really to focus on sexuality and erotism for couples. So uh, couples only, not single person. I know it's a bit different, but there were not a lot of product for couples. So we decided to create this narrative where one of you have the VR headset and the other one, thanks to a video, can like follow and synchronize his behavior to what the other one see. So basically... If you have a mermaid coming to you and then touching your shoulder, then at this exact moment, your partner will touch you with a watery or, you know, hands on your shoulder. So it will create the illusion, total illusion that you're in the scene. And all the story would go from like, will start before the game, which means during the day, you can like add some little like things to make your partner get into the mood. And then we'll end up back to you. So the point is really to bring back the story to you. And when you put away the VR headset, you continue the journey. We're not here to make you have sex. We're here to give you the little pinch of magic to make you enter your sexuality into a new scenarios that could break the routine and explore new things in your sexuality. Yeah, so cool. that was the beginning of what we do. Unfortunately, it's an industry that is quite hard. We can talk about it uh, before. So we kind of are moving into a multisensory uh, studio, VR studio, where we also provide other experience, more, but more for to connect again in intimacy, but sometimes not related to sexuality and not related to uh, couples, but more related to friends, family, for people who are uh, isolated and things like this. So we do this, we do NFTs, we do different things. We explore basically because we just love this, this area. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, so I want to I want to rewind a little bit. You'd mentioned that you wrote a book with somebody, and you didn't like their kind of dystopian future. And yeah. and one of the things I like to explore on the show is, you know, where you know, there, there's a lot, there's a wide range of possibilities of where this technology takes us or leads us. And and so, what was the when was that? And what was describe a little bit the dystopian future that you went not. I don't want that. I'm going to go in another direction. What was it? What was it? Oh, basically, it's going to be very kind of fast. So basically, this author, uh, I think he was lacking some knowledge first, first about the industry and about like basically the basics of psychology and sexology. To be totally honest, it's not in this era uh, from the start. And also what like made me very af afraid is that his vision was very deshumanized. 
I don't know if we say this, but there were, was not this touch of this human touch. It was basically, we're going to fuck with robots and the robots are going to replace us and we're going to live forever and like blah, 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 plus, uh, plus homophobic. When, <laughs> and, when was, and when was that? What year was that around? Oh, it was 2000. It was a long time ago. I think it was 2016. So Yeah, and so today, with all the stuff going on with AI and robotics now, like when you look back 20 years ago, how do you feel about that, um, you know, the potential for that future? Because we, it feels like we're perilously close to that, not from a, from a theoretical standpoint, from a practical standpoint, you know, where we're seeing things like, you know, robotics, artificial intelligence, deep fakes, um, teledildonics. For those of you that don't know that, you can look it up. We'll talk about that a little bit. And, and so do you, do, you, do you feel like that's still a risk that, or are we closer to that potential risk? So I would is, say, like, there's two different things. Like, as a psychologist and sexologist, I would say, like, uh, there is some robot, there is some AI chatbot and things like this. And I think it will be better and better with time. And it's, I think, a solution for some people. And I will state this very well. Like, I'm sorry to say, but no, it's not so easy to have a relationship, to have sex and to have intimacy uh, for everyone. It, it's not everyone cannot have it that simple and that's the truth and most of the people who are using it it's also because they lack this relationship and they are very aware that this is fake they don't think that like this is a real girlfriend but it makes them a little bit more happier than if they had nothing you know so i would not say that it's a bad thing in a way and if people say like, oh, okay, it's dramatic. Yeah, but like having no one to talk with, not having even a contact with sexuality is something that is very difficult to live for the people, for some of the people. And so this gives them a little bit a feeling of being part of something. So uh, it could work for the other people who don't have this issue. To be totally honest, they don't go to it. They don't check. Even though we see like, okay, there's robot, there is thing that exists. It's still like very minor percentage of population that are using it in the world. So I, it's it's pretty rare. Yeah. Are you familiar? There's a, there, and I don't remember the name of it. Um, I could probably look it up real quick. There's a chat platform that is specifically designed to create a personalized chat bot as a romantic partner for you. Um, are you familiar with that one? Yeah, I actually, I know lots of them different, but they also, yeah. they all work kind of the same. And I do think it, it can work, you know, and some people can have some bad experience with it. It's true, you know, but like everything, you can have a bad experience with a book too, just to, just to say, you know. Um, I'm not sure that people get extremely depressed because if it doesn't work, maybe a part of them, but it's a rare part of them. Yeah. You know, oh yeah, anyway, yeah. exactly. It was the one that I was thinking about actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and look, and I and I think and it's interesting. So we're go, you know, we, we we're going through this loneliness epidemic, right? That they've they've yeah. they've labeled it. And 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 then, you know, beyond that, we're seeing, I don't know if you follow Scott Galloway, he's become a bit of a of a, a bit of a of a of a pundit um, in, in this space of talking about, as an old white guy talking about young people's problems, um, we could just yeah. leave that, let that hang there for a minute. But, um, you know, he's talking about young men who don't have the skill set and the social skills or the tools yeah, yeah. or the access or whatever. You know, we're seeing the birth rates decline. They predict that by you know, 2050 or 2060, we're going to see peak population. And then we're going to start to see population, you know, depopulation. Yeah. We don't know how that's going to affect economies or, you know, it might be good for the planet health wise, yeah. but it might not be good economically. We don't know. We've never gone through that period of, of, of anything. Yeah. And Definitely. so, you know, how do you feel about this technology and, and, and where does it fit and where doesn't it fit? And should we embrace it? Should we reject it? How do you, how do you see it? Okay, so I would say that I think the main issue is uh, social politics. In It's why people then go to technology and other solution, you know. It would be the same when people say like, oh, this kid is only playing video games and want to escape from the world. 
is the video game the issue or is it the real world that doesn't provide him help to then go to the real to the real world from my point of view i would say there is an issue in the po social politics and then this come as a solution that is not the best solution but can provide a sol temporary solution for these people we can see this in lots of things like the ar robot if we talk about anima okay so most of the people will not have the skills to then you know, be in communication with real girls or real boys at the beginning. But maybe training themselves through this AI will help them to start to have more self-confidence to go in the real world. I don't say it's a solution. I just say that it exists because there is a problem yeah. like on the other side. And I don't think the problem is the emergence of this new technology. I think the problem comes from another you know, yeah, the, the technology else. is trying to solve a problem, whether it's the right yeah. solution for everyone or anyone is obviously a matter of opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think it's, it's more this, the issue, you know, um, this solution are not, to be honest, I tried some of them and they are funny. I'm going to be super honest. They are <laughs> actually more funny than like make i think people sometimes are super afraid because they imagine a black mirror you know things immediately but like if you try you're gonna see it's, it's kind of okay it's funny and why not you know and of course it's better in real life uh of course people will miss the real life uh mm -hmm. of course some of them could be you know drag into it and start to be like totally um addicted to this and it, it's it's a thing that can happen i don't think it's something that it, necessarily happen all the time and i think everything related to sexuality i think we always make a big thing about something that is sometimes not that crazy you know uh, we have the tendency to infantilize a human being and think they are not responsible and they cannot make the difference i can tell you that young people are really able to make the difference between an ai uh, chatbot that they <laughs> write to and to a real girl and that they will they wish to have a real person in front of them. And if they are doing it this way, it's mostly because they feel that they don't have the skills to go in the real life. And because sometimes the world is a little bit hostile to their own personality, physique, whatever, you know. So it's more, more this issue. Yeah. And so let's talk about that. Because one of the things, you know, we talked a little bit about avatars and, and VR chat and um, you know, and sex and people having virtual sex as avatars. And, you know, you'd mentioned people uncomfortable with their physical, um, yeah. you know, their physical presence, right. Or, or their physicality in the world. What's, you know, what, what are you seeing there? What have you observed? What have you experienced? And where does that, where does that lead us? So what I saw is like most of the people were experience uh, virtual relationships slash sex in virtual worlds are at, there's two types. There's the people who just want to have fun. They are playing already, you know, virtual games or computer games, and then they enter this world and then like, wait, why not? And met someone and they are just like exploring their life like this. But there's also some people who really feel not self-confident uh, in real life. They are very shy. Um, and so through this media, they're able to be themselves, really. And it's always what they say. I'm I'm myself. I can show my personality without being judged because I don't know, because uh, my eyes are looking like this or whatever thing, you know. And then they can really connect with someone for uh, with the true human being that they are inside of themselves, except from their body. What happens when they do this most of the time is that they create this connection, but they also exchange some picture. You know, it's not like if they are very straight and they don't see each other in the other in the real world. They connect like this but then they exchange pictures videos they call each other and they can meet from people from all over the world and then suddenly they just can find their i would say their person at this time and then they met in real life after sometime few years it's true because sometimes they are not they cannot like just travel like this but they have there is some beautiful amazing love story on i would say vr chat because it's the platform that mostly people use or fortnite or other but like they have some beautiful love story and they are very judged about this where the truth is like i don't find a big difference between this or doing tinder or other like you know social social um, application you know it's, yeah. it's kind of the same 
The only difference is, to be honest, that it's way more fun and way more immersive. And look, and look, I think there's this. I I I know that there's a broad swath of the population that has this attachment to the reality that we experience in what we call the real world, right? Like yeah. like my body, what I see, what I take in with my senses, this table, this computer, this microphone, right? <clears throat> and 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 there's a generation uh, of people, humans that are growing up with technology, you know, they're called digital natives and you know, yeah. I think the next the next generation, you know, will wind up being virtual natives and there's this great snippet that I've used in my keynotes with Keanu Reeves giving an interview about the the Matrix 4 movie and he said he was telling a story um that to this teenage girl who had never seen the matrix and he's like oh yeah it's about this guy and and he he doesn't know what's real and is this computer world and he can't tell what's real and what isn't real and she's like why does it matter and he yeah. said what do you mean why does it matter you don't care if it's real or if it's virtual and she's like no and and he was just like whoa right and and there's this because we're attached to this sense of reality that we've grown up with and and for a whole generation of people or multiple generations that grew up gaming and now are doing virtual reality like why is that less real than what we're doing right now which is just pixels going over the internet from a camera and microphone and 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 shit and and this is real but that's not and i don't understand why people are so attached and and reject this virtual experiences that people have to be honest i think like you're right on the fact that there is a shift now on like the new generation like we can see it like mostly with i would say instagram or tiktok uh people are both virtuals being and like actual beings actually there are some books in psychology starting to explore this what we call the me cyborg in a way, which mm. is your attachment to your virtual self and how you behave with your virtual self. And I think it's very interesting to understand the, this new paradigm in our lives and on the new generation. If I could say why people are so afraid, I think people are afraid because they don't know what is virtual reality mostly. Um, there is an, when, like, I think you had the same experience than me, like multiple times in your life. Uh, you want to show someone some VR and the person is like freaking out, like, oh no, but will I lose my sense of reality? They they almost think they're going to take LSD with it. Like, no, not at all. You, you're gonna <laughs> I was just going to say, it's like offering somebody a psychedelics for the yeah, first like, time. Yeah, like, you're going to oh. know, don't worry, you cannot uh, wait. But they are very afraid of this. And most of the people who are afraid of it are people who don't know how it works and don't they are not familiar to this new technology. And I think as human being, we always have the fear of the unknown. It's, it, I mean, let's, it's the same for racism. It's, it's the same concept in a way. Death, fear like, of death, I don't right? know, I reject or I aggress, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's something very normal yeah. and it's okay to have this. So when you're afraid, I think the best way is to listen to people who knows and can show you slowly like this, you can get used to it and then be like, Oh, actually, it can be funny. Oh, actually, it's not that bad. And this is something that I'm super used to to have some. Uh, uh, it, this is something that I have lots of comment about it. Before I show them something about erotism, they are very afraid how they will react. And most of the people tell me like, "Oh, I will not like it. Oh, I'm not into this. Oh, uh, no, I don't want to try. I'm afraid it's gonna do something to me. And when they try, mostly all the time, it's like, oh, that's super funny. Oh, I didn't expect it to be <laughs> into furry, <laughs> like all stuff like this. Whereas they are not necessarily, but they they discover that this can be funny, and that maybe the people who are doing it are not like freaks, totally freaks. They are just people who love to explore. They are most of the time creative people, and that it's a new playground. Whereas yeah. they can maybe find something for themselves in order to express themselves or to live a different life. Uh, but it needs education. And that's, a, I think your show is part of it, you know, like in a way I, think it, look, I, I think it needs education, but people also are so 
you know, and, and, and I'll ask you about this, like people are, have so many hangups about sex, right? And so, yeah. um, you know, is any of this, does any of this, do you think help break that down or is it going to further potentially divide, you know, the people who just are, or just reject their own shadow and impulses um, because there's their shame involved, right? And societal disapproval or whatever. Like, how do these tools and how does this technology, do you think is going to play in that space? It, it's like, I would say it's difficult to answer this question because to be honest, I do think it will divide a little bit the people if we don't have education around it. Uh, that's, that's the first thing. Uh, and also because people think very black and white sometimes. Like, you know, lots of people tell me like, I don't need it. And I was like, yeah, but I, you don't need a mojito at the end of your day, but you enjoy to have a mojito at the end of your day sometimes, not all the day, obviously, but like, you know, you don't need it, but it's nice to have it. You know, it's, it's changing from like, why to why not? You know, it's like a little bit this, um, some other people, I think they will come into this world slowly and then they will enjoy it and maybe use it sometimes not making it their sexual life but understand like okay i can have a normal sexual life and sometimes for fun just using some vr or some teledildonics or whatever things you know it's just like new tools that you can add into your sexuality to break the routine and it's how you need to see it and some people will only do this that's true but if they only do this, it means that it fit to them and we're like very different human beings. And yeah, some people really love to only do VR and some people love to mix and some people only do the, do the real. And it's, I think it's okay to have different, um, di different like, um, uh, I don't know what to say, but like to like it or not, you know, yeah. the only problem is to rejecting it uh, as like something crazy and very bad and exactly because if you think this it's just that you never try and to be honest the only people who talk very bad about it and I see it very commonly in my work are people that most of the time even never tried computer gaming I would be like even they never even try FIFA you know like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they have a judgment about it that it, and they're also surfing on the on the horrible and this is more likely to to media and what make the buzz. You know, I I saw this video lots of time. We had this. I think we all saw it about like, oh, someone have been raping the metaverse of Facebook. You know, I um, want to be very clear. It's very different from a rape, and I'm like, I'm gonna make a, a big thing about it just because there is some victim who have been like uh, raped for real, and there is a big difference. But it's still harassment, and it's still very hard to leave, and it's still um, very dramatic. But they made a lot of movement and talks and things about these things, this experience of one person, but we rarely see things about all the love story and the good of, you know, the other side. Yeah. And look, and, and so I want to, I want to touch on that because if, you know, if sex in VR, if intimate relationships in VR, if those experiences in VR can be meaningful, then, then being assaulted in VR can also have those same yeah. psychological impacts. Yeah, it's so I don't want to, I don't want to diminish it, but the media loves to it, amply negative stories, yeah, right? Yeah, this is like it is still an harassment, and it's still very hard to live. And like to be honest, I already had it myself, so I can tell you, yes, it's hard. Yeah, it's not easy, and yeah, it's like an aggression. Like this is true, but it's different from the reality. And oh yeah, you have to, we met in yeah. And so I want to, I just want to touch on this for a second. So there's a great movie lives. documentary on HBO like called "We Met in, in Virtual Reality," and I'm Amazing sure one. you've seen it, right? Uh, I loved it. For me, it was a very I beautiful one. I am a teacher one. for Helping Hands. Yeah, and it, and it basically went through this story of somebody who you like know this. made and built a, re a relationship so, in VR like, chat, and then ultimately came together and they met each other after they had built this relationship and they talked about all of what that experience was yeah. like and you know and and distance relationship um, in different VR, modalities miles, with different apart, avatars but we're going to try our that best to make it work their, yeah. what they really, really feel hard. like in the a way that they that can't me necessarily VR do and the VR day to day in the real world I and I always put the real world in quotations yeah. because I don't believe that this is the only reality, right? We make our own reality. You have you yours, Kathleen, I have mine. 
um, and we can have start and, over. And we all assume we that we're experiencing the same reality, but we're not. There's seven billion realities. Really and also, you will govern your true virtual reality. Years I've seen Kevin's. You know, yeah, this yeah. moment for them were real, and like I can I can talk about like I've I've experienced a, a love relationship in VR for two years with um, my ex boyfriend. We're we're still in very good contact because I love to have people. Most of the times they are like, ah, if you are not anymore together, it means that it was not working for this. No, it was not VR. VR saved our life, I would say. And you know, I I did, and it's also why I was so much in VR chat because I met this uh, amazing person in VR days. <laughs> well. <laughs> And we were both working in virtual reality, but it was the pandemic. So we had, we wanted to connect and hopefully, hopefully, thanks God, we had a VR headset. I, I can say thanks God, because it was so amazing that we had this. And then we started to explore our love relationship, our identities, um, sexuality through, through VR. And this experience is still one of my most beautiful experience in my life that I had. Yeah. Um, first, because I built so many souvenirs with him in VR worlds, but also I can tell you something very funny. Like when we quitted each other, we decided like, okay, our relationship is over, difficulties, it will not work. We actually continued it for a few months in virtual reality because every time we would see each other in VR, we were like, yeah, but here it's different. <laughs> And it was super funny to have this. And at some point we had this discussion about like, yep. okay, what is it if you met someone there in VR and if you shared this and, and it's super strange what I would say, but this world were, was so much something important for us. We experienced mm. so much beautiful things and so much emotional moment in VR. And we met also friends to VR and everything that we couldn't really let it go at some point. And even though in the real life it was not working, we were like uh, struggling to let go of this VR relationship. And we are still very good friends now. And I think that was part of the fact that we are still very good friends and respect each other so much is that we shared a moment that was extraordinary thanks to virtual reality. Uh, the sense of touch, uh, the, the exploration of sexuality through new identities, you know, even this, like in VR, I can be like, we were like having the same avatar and trying to have like erotic moment. And we were like having so much fun about it. We you mean the, like, same, oh, the same creepy. avatar as yeah. each other? So Yeah, we would have yeah, exactly the same avatar and try to have erotic experience together. And we were like, okay, that is so strange because your brain like trick you, you know, and you're like, oh, it's it's strange. It's me. Or sometimes we were exploring, okay, you're gonna be a monster, I'm gonna be a tiny, uh, tiny, I don't know, tomato soup or whatever thing, you know, or I'm gonna be a like object, you're gonna be a TV and I will be a drawer. And let's try to see how it works and how our brain functions. So it was also for both of us a real exploration of VR worlds and identities and you know, like how it works, like, okay, if you change, if I'm a man and you're a woman, what does it make into our sexuality? What does it make into our brain? Uh, also, you know, there were these, there were also the fact that we were meeting more in VR than in real life because of the pandemic. So it was more rare. And every time we would met again in real life, even though we had each other on phone, obviously we were like FaceTiming and everything. But FaceTime is 2D, you know, and I was used to see him in 3D with his avatar. One of, he had different one, but one was my favorite. And every time I would think about him, I would think also about his avatar. It was, you know, different characters in my mind. And when we would see each other, I would be a bit afraid, like, oh, is this going to work? You know, it, like, do I will like him, like, or love him or find him attractive in real? It, it was yeah. lots of questions that... And it was always okay, but like there were this sense of like stress before and anxiety of the mix of the real and the virtual. And at the end, it was always super nice and super good. And uh, talking to him, like he told me, it was the same for me. Uh, like he had the same experience. Like, oh, you are, you are like this rainbow cat in VR. Yeah, I know, I'm a rainbow cat in VR. <laughs> and then uh, you are this Kate, <laughs> Caitlin, like in real life which are two different person, but the same. And 
yeah, it's something like that is strange to experience, but at the same time, so beautiful. I, I really need to say that I think it was one of my most be beautiful love story and I will keep it for all my life, you know, and I know it's the same for him. Now I hope he have a better life, like another life and super beautiful, but still this was something different. And I think we were able to understand what people were living in this world, you know, going to wedding, exploring your, your your body differently i'm a small person i'm like one meter sixty um i don't know in each how it's made but like uh and i could have this avatar where i was a giant person yeah. and i loved it i need to say it's beautiful to be tall <laughs> and and it was just nice to experience different feeling and break the routine through this um media you know through vr yeah yeah cool what the, so you, you know you, you you've talked about you know how it it changes potentially your relationship to to how you your your body and how you manifest and there's a there's a a, a, a VR experience that's been getting called Body of Mind, which has been getting a lot of attention um, recently. Have you have you seen that? I actually did not, but I heard about it, but I did not actually yeah. try it. And it's and it's basically it's on Quest now. It's actually anybody can download it. I think it was a location based experience first, and and at a bunch and it won a bunch of awards at the various you know film festivals, and um, and it's basically about a, a trans person and their relationship to their body and how and how and the VR experience kind of puts you in that. Um, in that in that experience, I guess I haven't done it myself yet. I probably should. I probably should have done it in advance of the show. So I apologize for not being prepared. Um, but I'm I'm curious about your thoughts about yeah. how it can be used from a as a as a psychologist and and and, yeah. and therapist and sexologist and therapist. You know how can we use these um, these these tools to help people that are you know that are suffering from their relationship to their identity. Actually, it's very interesting that you you talk about this subject uh, first because like um, Daniel that I'm working with uh, with Beyond Another Lab, he built an experience where you can embody the feeling and the experience and the narrative of a transgender person. So that was my like kind of first way uh, using VR in this specific topic, but also because with my patient. So uh, I have some patients who are transgender person or like from every age like uh, type of person whatever you want yeah and we talked a lot about this subject because i think it's a very interesting thing so there's there's first the people that i met like that already have an avatar that correspond to the, their gender uh and they are using computer games from way before they met me to use it but the funny thing is that they would come to me and feel like maybe a shame about this or like is it like something good or not and i'm like this is perfect do you feel good yeah perfect do it you know like if people are okay with it i'm okay with it uh but also with uh, other person that come to me and they're in the transition but not yet you know the transition is not yet made and so they are suffering from lots of like um problematic you know like the feeling of not being in their body is something very 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 hard to live and so I would put them in VR into a body they like, you know, like a male body or a woman body, like depending on what they, they feel. And it just really is lots of stress. They feel very good. They're always mm -hmm. crying, you know, they're like, oh, I feel myself. I also like on this subject, I'm kind of lucky because I know I do a little bit of 3D myself. <laughs> so um, I propose some of my patients to build with them their avatar, like a girl that or a woman like or a man that they really like and that help them, you know, to really feel like, yeah, it's me. It's my new me. Um, so say, I will just put them into it and we can talk. Uh, I have a consultation where they embody their real body and that changed a lot. Because when they talk to you with the body that they feel safe with, they don't share the same thing with you than if they are in the body that they don't like. So we can see a difference. And it's yeah, interesting. It, it's just amazing to give them disability. And I think that there is not a lot of psychologists, sexologists doing this. I mean, in France, I can tell you for sure no one. <laughs> but maybe in the United States, you have more people doing this. I don't know. But that's really helped them to feel more secure and to share new issues. And that also make them like, okay, maybe I like it, but maybe, oh, wait, 
seeing me with big breasts is not something I like. Maybe I like smaller breasts, you know, like it's a very stupid little question. Yeah. But that are not stupid for them, especially in a transition moment, you know. So I think I think people in gaming uh, or in virtual world are way more open to this, uh, I would say, like... Um, mix of gender this this fluidity of genders they are way more cool with this idea like yeah do you, I, do you think that's do you think that's a function because we've had a you know the, the most recent statistics i've seen around gamers is that like 70 percent of the popular adult population now you know millennial and younger can you know identify as gamers right and so yeah. do you think you know is is it where's the do you do you think about the cause and effect is it because they've grown up where playing games where there's a you know a a computer rendered version of themselves in this virtual world that gives that lends to more fluidity about identity or do you think it's it's there's something else you know that is it just you know increased consciousness as as generations evolve that the younger population is just more conscious as i think I get, happens with each generation right and i, I think and they're the, just you know they're less uptight about things and more con about about those things and more open to what's possible i'm, I'm curious about your thinking around that I, actually i think like to be honest i think feminism generally talking which includes just the equality between men and women and like putting like a, this, this as a subject um made a lot for this i think like transgender people i mean i know always existed and it's just that now they have a voice and before they had to shut up you know yeah but when you see in some other country where you can go to jail or be murdered for this <laughs> there is not a lot of transgender or even like gay person in this yeah. country strangely you know but obviously if if i tell you i murder you if you put your voice on on this subject you you for sure, you're going to shut up, you know, yeah. at some point you're going to say like, well, you know. Um, so I think like the fact that the more, in a way, democracy, but also the, the, the countries made it more open to be yourself and to be maybe a little bit more an individual and considered as different help to spread the world, the, the message, the world. And then these all the like feminists and like other like psychology, I would say medical research and everything that slowly open up this subject that were closed before. Also, because like, I think it's more difficult to open it when the country is very um, religious, of course, because it's, it's kind of difficult to understand for some people who are in religion and who are not like gay or are not transgender because they they you know they they don't understand where it come from it's it's really i think a, a lack of education in this subject you know that that drives people to have like uh fear about what's going on i'm not sure the gaming like was part of this in this way i think the gaming was a good solution and that like at this moment people are like oh well i can be anyone and then if you're a transgender person and you can be anyone then that's nice to be the one yourself and for other people it's not like oh i don't feel transgender i don't feel gender fluid um you know fluid i don't feel this but it's just super funny to have big boobs you know <laughs> just, just i will say it like <laughs> you know it can be only this you know it can be yeah. just for fun that they're using it and for some other people it's more about their own identity so yeah. i think there's all these things just you know help each other to move forward and and in this sense, I think the new the, the generation, this new generation, the new politics, the new talks, the mondialization and everything help a lot um, for these people because they found a community. Uh, internet did a lot. I mean, people were just feeling alone in their family and then they go on internet and like, wow, I'm not the only one. Oh, well, and they built a community and they can share advice and they can just breathe a little bit in a world that is not totally made for them. And, uh, and that's, that's nice, I think. Yeah. So I want to, I get, I get this question a lot. Like, you know, historically there's a narrative that, you know, porn drives new technology adoption, right? Like, you know, DVD, you know, yeah. VHS and, 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 and the internet and now virtual reality. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions about, you know, why why 
VR porn isn't driving more consumer adoption of virtual reality. Now, first of yeah. all, that's an assumption. We don't know that's that it true. is or it isn't because not everybody's out there talking about, oh, I got this new Quest headset so I can have more porn, yeah. right? And so it, it tends to be an underground, it tends to be an underground yeah. movement. Um, and, and so I'm just curious about what are you seeing out there in the world of, you know, consumer behavior regarding VR applications, content, you know, peripherals, like let's yeah. talk about what's happening there. So there's different things. So I do think maybe, I do think that porn has always been creative and like sexuality to find new ways to have sexuality or things. I think that is true. And it's why like when there is a new technology, most of the time, then the porn come and is like, oh, how are we going to use this? But not only porn, like generally talking, we try to see what we can do about it, you know, in sexuality. And sometimes we search for new thing. In the specific field of virtual reality, uh, we made some questionnaires and we asked people, like, did you ever try VR porn? And to be honest, most of the people, if they have a VR headset, already tried. That doesn't mean that they consume it. Because some people will consume it like I would say regularly, let's say every two weeks, months, you know, but most of the people try it. They found it funny, but they will not come back to it easily. For one reason, just you have to put your VR headset, you have to go on the things, you have to download the stuff, you have My to be a little bit yeah. geek, like, you know, geek. So the, the user experience is not super easy. Then the other thing is that you're strangely kind of deprived of your senses. So you never know if someone is entering a room. <laughs> Yep. which makes you a little bit stressed when you're using it and if you're not alone. So that's another problem, you know, that, that come in, in the road of this. So uh, there is this. And then if you really look like, yes, there are some people using VR porn, but to be honest, uh, not a lot to compare to phone or compare to lots of things. Because I, I'm going to be a bit strange when I would say this. It's nice, you know, VR porn is kind of funny, but it's first super, super cliche. When I say super cliche, it's like the worst cliche thing you can see on porn normal. <laughs> you, have yeah. it, you have it in VR. You know, it's not very like crazy. I mean, some, there is some that are super funny. It's true, but it's, it's mostly rare. And then most of the people, they use porn very fast. You know, they don't even, they never watch a full video of one hour. They, you know, they go to the moment they like, okay, in 30 seconds, three minutes, it's done. Ciao, bye-bye. I'm going back to my work, you know. People are not like, oh, I'm going to make a real moment with it. It happened, but it's pretty rare. So I think it's also the issue of all this user experience where you have to log in, do this, do this. It's a little bit long. I think what would work more is actually the VR uh, erotic games uh, where you embody your character, you have a real gaming experience. and Inside of this gaming experience, sometimes you have moments where there is erotic things or yeah. porn or whatever, you know. And this, and then like you're not doing VR for the erotic, but you're coming into the erotic through this, you know. And then that works super well. And I think it's actually super funny and nice. And maybe the journey is a little bit more in more more um, nice than just watching a porn like that you yeah. can watch on your phone, you know? So there's a, there's a big movement in, you know, the creator economy around like with only fans and, and fans and sites like that, where, you know, more individual creators rather than studios creating cliched porn, there's, yeah. you know, individual creators creating adult content. Yeah. And I think about what was going on, you know, in VR chat and some of the things that happened there. And is there anything, are you seeing any, um, you know, creators doing anything interesting in the adult content creation um, yeah. with virtual reality yet? Actually, it's true that it's like virtual mate that is great because virtual mate, uh, maybe I can put it in virtual mate. I'll pull it up. Go ahead. But, uh, the nice things about this is that it's a software where you can, okay, you can or experience like erotic scenes made by others. Or you can like design all the scene for you and make it yourself, which is this. I think it's very nice. I think when when we mix, uh, yeah, it's exactly this. It, yeah. it looks strange. The, the website is not the best, but to be honest, it's an amazing website. Um, just because you can check like everything you want, scenes, position. It's you need a little bit like of of uh, 
geek sk skills, as I say. Yeah. Um, but there's lots of things that are nice, you know, in this. And the fact to be able to create your own things yourself is giving you a sense of control that is nice. You know, it gives you something that you cannot have in, in the real porn thing. You know, so you have like um, valeur ajoutée, you know, something more. Um, and it's very funny. I recommend everyone to go on this website and build a porn for their friend's birthday. It's very amazing. All my friends have been very happy that I built them specific porn for them. Funny one. So <laughs> it's a nice gift to do. But like, except from this, you have like these games. Um, you have different like little games. Like it's, it's. I'm sorry because right now I have, don't have all the names of it, but you can find them easily. It's nice. It's not crazy, but it's nice. But the thing you need to know that like really make it that difficult for creators to build some new platform and new games and new thing in this industry. First, it's that VR cost a lot. That's a true thing. So the cost is so expensive compared to what you get in terms of clients yeah. that it's starting to be very tricky to go in this industry nowadays for this specific reason. Then you have this. Then most of the time when you want to make something a bit different or, you know, not cliche, poor and mainstream, blah, blah, blah. Um, I call it McDonald porn to be honest. <laughs> To show you like <laughs> like you know it's like a no sense but it fit you like you get no taste but it fit <laughs> so it's like uh you need most of the time like investment and things like that and huge investment if you want to capitalize against like the yeah. huge industry you know that are already there and everything and that is very difficult because we're always in between the, you know like okay you will have or big companies on porn industry that will want to buy your company or do some things but then they will give you some really strong uh, specific guideline which could be like it was the problem that we had in our company uh, against or on values so then like oh tricky to go in this in to, to get investment from them and then on the other side you will have other investors that are totally not in this industry and are very very uh shy about investing in this industry or afraid that it give uh that it block yeah. themselves in other businesses yeah and i i can also understand their position and um uh, so they will yeah. have this or they will be like yeah but your niche is a little bit too specific and and you know i want my investment fast and i don't want my name so much associated to this so i feel a little bit insecure and i get it you know in a way uh but then it's why it's a little bit block everywhere, you know. It's yeah. difficult to make new things. So yeah, it's hard to get. Big, it's hard to make things in VR. It's hard to make things in yeah. porn. You put the Venn diagram over the yeah, people. Yeah, oh, it's very that hard. Is very small. And yeah. also in this industry, you are block everywhere. You know, for Instagram posts, you have lots of issues. To get a bank account, you have lots of issues. You always, always have to sell yourself way more than other company. Yeah. And I would say even like, you know, for me to do conferences at the beginning, okay, now it's more easy, but at the beginning, uh, I would receive tons of emails, you know, like asking like, but what is the subject? What is inside? People would be very afraid about what I will talk in the conference. <laughs> and I could see the difference with other people. And I was like, hey, I'm a psychologist, sexologist. Don't worry. I, <laughs> I can make it. I'm going to talk about it in a way that it will not make the full things go wrong, you know, it's going to be okay. But they were afraid and I also can get it, but it makes you having a lot, a lot, a lot of work more. Yeah. And at some point it can be a bit like, whoa, it's exhausting to fight that much yeah. for a product that seems sometimes very normal for us also. Yeah. What's So where does, where do you, what's the thing you're most excited about when it comes to the intersection of you know, VR, the metaverse, and, you know, and sex. Like, it, I'll just keep it really broad. To, What's the to, thing that's most To be most totally exciting? honest, I would say, like, the full motion capture. <laughs> like, the full motion capture for me, like, without, like, having too much other stuff around you, like, very easy would be the most amazing thing. Just because having, like, being able to really see your fingers, like, right now it's the case, you know, but, like, uh, also maybe facial expression yeah. and everything will give a total new new way to experience sexuality through virtual reality. So one thing would be this, uh, and obviously to have, 
to expand the new virtual worlds. Like I'm always talking a lot about uh, VR chat because for me it's the most creative one, one of the most creative one for night also. But like this one is really okay. I love it very much, you know. So um, so if we could extend this world and have more abilities, that would be amazing. So one thing is about VR. The other stuff that I'm looking forward very much is uh, AR. To be honest, like because AR. If I could just like, you know, put little wings to my boyfriend, he would hate me saying this. <laughs> well, we have sex. It would be so funny, you know. If I could change, I would not say change the person because it's not what you want where you're in love. But if you could like, you know, get some wings or crazy thing and then have yeah. sex in different worlds, that would be. So I'm really looking forward for augmented reality and better motion capture that allow you to have like to really feel that it's very fluid to have your own movement. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think this is the last question. I reserve the right to ask more. What's where do you think? Where do you think the industry is going, um, and and how are we as a society, right, and as a as a species, what do we need to do to prepare for what is coming? Because I don't think most people have a clue as to the change that is yeah. we're we're on the precipice of as we spend more time in virtual worlds, whether they're, it's mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, whatever you call it, it's, it's, a, it's a different, it, it's a way of, of warping what we believe is reality into something different and giving p other people control over it and stuff. What do we need to do as a species, as humans to prepare for that? I'm going to be honest, we need to learn, but like to have more knowledge. So one thing, how it will go, uh, I think like the first thing that it's going to explode a bit more is everything related to AI, mostly. Uh, because it's easy, it's still on our phone, we're used to the phone, and I think that will kind of be the first uh, revolution. Um, helping to flirt, getting like maybe AI boyfriend, companionship, psychologist, whatever. It will not be perfect, but I think it's people will go a little bit into this. And then after, obviously, I would call it like kind of, oh, it's difficult in English to say, but it will like like the mix of the virtual and the real. You know, I think we'll make these two worlds connected together and jump from one to other. A little bit what we do with, I would say, Instagram or TikTok, yeah, you yeah. know, we have our life there and we have, and I think people will feel super self-confident into this and play between these two uh, realities because I would not say a VR is not reality. I would not say AR is not reality. I would say it's not persistent worlds, but it's still reality. What you experience, your emotion, your souvenirs, everything is real. It, you know, it would be the same as like, oh, I watched a movie and this was not reality. Yeah, it was a moment. It was reality. But the movie itself was not a persistent world. It was not mm. a real world, but it was still real. So I think it will mix like this. Um, what I would recommend to anyone, and it's why also I'm doing this, is like to learn, really, to read some articles, to watch some shows, like the Being Virtual show is a very good one, on others about this subject. You yeah. know, like, it's just learn to not be afraid and to not get caught with i would say in a way it's not fake news but with the dramatic part so that is a very important uh, thing to research learn from real uh, specialists the second things that i think is important is to be very aware that in vr or sexuality and things we can do everything we want but that doesn't mean we wa we want or need everything uh, so i think it's to move on um, to try to create things that are linked to our values and core values, which is for me, freedom and like connection with people. Um, so I think we need to be very uh, aware of this and think like, okay, we can do everything with technology, but that does that fit to what we want for the future of our life? You know, it's the same as like, we can do a, a great, very hardcore go porn if we want, you know, but I'm not sure it's something we need personally. So I want to make the this sexuality go more to art and beauty and connection with people because that are my values personally. So yeah. it's why I want I'm working in this field to make 
you know, the thing go there. But we can also do the opposite. And on some subjects, we always have to think like, okay, like what experts think about this? You know, to think like, maybe I don't know all about this, all the perspective and this idea that seems brilliant at first because it drives money, because it's like, I don't know, you know, may at the end be a bad solution. And it's why you need to test it to be sure it doesn't provide something bad to people. I would say like bad feelings or you no know, low self-confident or maybe make them depressed or everything and try a maximum to make it evaluate um, according to our core values and yeah. You know, beauty of the world. I would say, you know, that's what I like. Yeah. If look, so if if somebody wants to dip their toe in the water of this intersection of, you know, virtual reality and and sex, what's you know, other than going on and looking at industrialized porn sites, what do you recommend is the easiest, simplest way for people to kind of dip their toe in the water? Uh, I would tell them to go to see some conferences and like you know there's lots of sex tech uh, venues that exist all over the world they are mm. very small to be honest they are mostly yeah. small event uh, but i would tell them to go there because then you're going to see the funny ones the um, the freak but also the creatives and the more philosophical people persons so i would tell the person to go to this event and talk with the people. They are very accessible. Like everyone in the sex tech industry, to be totally honest, they are all super funny and super open. You know, it's yeah, not really very difficult. I, you can go did, easily. Yeah, look, I just did a Google search and uh, for sex tech conferences and and there's yeah, all is super know, nice from the European one. If yeah, never, yeah. Like, so she's a fantastic person. We'll have to we'll have to I'll have to do a little bit more of a deep yeah. dive there and uh, and figure out which conference I'm gonna go to. Because yeah, I think that would be fascinating. Yeah, and it's you need to know it's small event. It's true, but it's very funny, and you see lots of creative people. And I think it's the best way uh, to 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 yeah. get yourself introduced to this topic first. Um, or sometimes you see some, you know, you can find some probably like yeah. interviews and things online would be maybe even easier at first. And then I would tell create yourself. Try to create yourself and to yeah. show your vision because you don't have to be good. No, don't worry. I would say to everyone, don't worry. You don't have to be good. You just have to be a little bit creative. And if it's bug, if it's not perfect, everyone want, will want to help you. And this is where there is the magic. You know, it's also when you show a part of vulnerability and just trying something new. And, yeah. and that's that's what people love also. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, Kathleen and Imbu VR is the website. Um, how do people, what's the, what's, what's your favorite social platform for people to connect with you on? Ooh, I would say Instagram to be totally honest, yeah, cool. uh, with my name, Caitlin Smooth. Um, but oh yeah, I'm working in tech, but I'm not the best one in techno in, uh, in Instagram or all the thing. I really, I really love to be or in VR <laughs> or to explore the new world outside. <laughs> All right. So Kathleen Smooth, reach out on Instagram. Um, I will see you. I assume I'm just going to pull up your Insta real quick and see if we can bring that up because I'm. Just... Or oh, there is my website also smooth.fr, like fr. Yeah, yep. you have this. On my website, it's my name.fr is also. It's also a way to connect with me easily. And you have all the videos. We did things with Cara de la Vigne. We did things with lots of people that were. And your TED talk and your TED talk on yeah. there too, which shows up on um, when I pull it up on online, which was fascinating. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, look, I want to appreciate you coming on and doing the work that you're doing. And um, and I can't I can only imagine how challenging it is to work at that intersection of virtual reality, is. which is hard, and then, you know, and then sex. <laughs> education is hard and and so you're yeah. you know you've you've picked a you've picked a fascinating important and challenging business to be in and kudos to you to for sticking to it and doing great am amazing important work Thank you yeah. so much, Bob Kone. I'm super happy. The first that I met you, we had great fun on all the event, I need to say. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for all your work and thank you for inviting me in the show. And I'm very happy to be now one person part of the being virtual show yeah thanks for being here stick around i'll come right back to you 
that's it for um, another version of the Being Virtual Show. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Bob Cooney. You can follow um, and get notifications about new shows at beingvirtual.tv. You can um, follow me at bobcooney.com or on LinkedIn where I'm very active. And um, until the next time, stay immersed. <laughs>